Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this panel, Histories of Homosexuality, Labor, and Police in Modern French History, a roundtable round table in honor of Michael Sibelius. I'm William Penniston, the librarian and the archivist at the Newark Museum, and also a French historian, uh, a historian of French sexuality, in fact. Before I introduce our speakers today, um, I would like to say a few words about Michael. Michael was a prolific uh, writer of essays and articles and a frequent presenter of uh, conference papers, uh, not only here at the Western Society for French History, but elsewhere in uh, un the United States, in Canada, and in France. And uh, I might add, he did it in French and in English. Uh, his specialization was the history of labor relations, policing, and homosexuality in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree from McGill University and his doctorate from Concordia University, uh, and he studied under George Roudet. Um, he was professor of history at Wilfrid Laureate University for over 25 years. Uh, but more importantly, he was a remarkable colleague and a great mentor. He was always willing to share his new findings in archives with his friends. Uh, he passed away in April at the age of 69. Today, um, three colleagues, mentees and friends, will discuss one of Michael's essays or articles and will relate it to their own work. Um, and they are Tamara Chaplin, uh, who received a PhD from Rutgers University, who is now uh, Associate Professor of Modern European History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and who is the author of Turning on the Mind, French Philosophers on Television. Uh, she has a manuscript, Desiring Women, Female Same-Sex Intimacy, and the French Public Sphere, under review at the University of Chicago Press. Andrew Israel Ross, who graduated from the University of Michigan with a doctorate in history, is our second speaker. Uh, he has recently joined the staff of the um, Department of History at Loyola University in Maryland. Uh, and his book, Public City, Public Sex, Homosexuality, Prostitution, and Urban Country culture in 19th century Paris was just published by Temple University Press. Like Michael, Howard Brown is a Canadian. He, <laughs> <laughs> he uh, ha oh, you are, well, I'll be darned. Uh, he has an undergraduate degree from the University of Saskatchewan and a doctorate from Oxford University. And like Michael, he is an expert on the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Empire. He has written three books on the subject. His latest book is Mass Violence and the Self, From the French Wars of Religion to the Paris Commune. He is professor of history at uh, uh, Binghamton University, the State University of New York. Um, and one final word, I met Michael at a conference organized by Tip Reagan and uh, Jeffrey Merrick at the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies at the City University of New York in November 1994. He was finishing up his path-breaking uh, essay on re the regulation of male homosexuality in revolutionary and Napoleonic France. And I was finishing up my essay on love and death in, per in gay Paris homosexuality and criminality in the 1870s. Both uh, essays were published in Homosexuality in Modern France, edited by Tip Reagan and Jeffrey Merrick, and that, of course, was one of the first collections in English on that topic. Since then, we have met at numerous conferences where we've discussed our own work and the work of our colleagues, and I will miss those conversations. So first, Tamara Chaplin, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign.
I first met Michael at a sexuality conference also in Amsterdam that was organized by um, Hekma and Alain Giami in 2011. And my book project on the history of lesbian life in France from 1930 to the present, which hopefully will be completed very soon, um, developed over the same years that our friendship did. And I found Michael's work tremendously useful in thinking about my own. So when Andrew and I talked about forming this panel as a tribute to Michael, we thought it might be useful to use his work as a kind of heuristic orienting device um, for our own interventions by selecting specific scholarship of his that spoke to our research. And um, I chose two pieces. One was his 1999 book chapter, Paris, in David Higgs' edited collection, Queer Sites, Gay Urban Histories Since 1600. And the other was his 2004 article, Urban Space and Homosexuality, The Example of the Marais, Paris, Gay Ghetto. In the first of these, Michael produced a work of urban geography, mapping the ways in which a homosexual subculture perambulated across the Parisian map from the 18th century to the present. In his later article on the Gay Marais, Michael made two key points. The first is that we cannot understand the emergence of the Gay Marais without taking economic and social factors, namely low rents, availability for gentrification, access to public transit, the emergence of a gay male market, and the motives of investors and customers into account. The second, and to my mind actually the more interesting claim, is that as much as the Gay Marais is a real neighborhood, it is also an imagined cityscape that has polyvalent meanings dependent on the prejudices, wishes, and desires, and I'm quoting him, of various constituents. To that end, in addition to tracing the vital importance of the gay marais to queer populations, Michael addresses the rejection of this neighborhood, both by homosexuals who decry it as a little artificial world that ghettoizes its inhabitants, and by homophobic residents who use the arguments of communitarianism and anti-universalism to condemn the gay marais as having a separatist agenda. But today I want to focus on a smaller and generally overlooked aspect of these two works, which is their relative disavowal of the importance of women to the urban history of homosexuality. Indeed, in echoing sociologist Manuel Castell's influential 1983 conclusion, and he was working on Gay San Francisco, Michael's claim that, quote, lesbian communities are less territorially based than gay male communities, and lesbians socialize far less in bars and clubs than do male homosexuals, unquote, essentially dismisses any need to address queer female space when assessing the French or any other public sphere. Sorry, Michael. I'd like to quickly rehearse some of my arguments. I've actually talked to him. I talked to him about these ideas, um, and it was really fruitful. But I'd like to quickly rehearse some of my arguments uh, from my own work. Um, that refute this position. And I'm going to do this by talking about the history of an entertainment venue called the Sapphic Cabaret. And for those of you who know me, I'm kind of like the lesbian girl. I've been talking about this for years. So I'll talk about it some more now. So I'm going to focus on two arguments. Um, the first one concerns time. Scholars claim that after a golden age in Paris in the early 20th century, women who loved women basically became invisible in France from about the Second World War until the 1970s. The history of the Sapphic Cabaret demonstrates instead that queer women have had a continuous presence in the French public sphere throughout the 20th century. My second argument concerns space. Whereas scholars argue, like Michael, that in contrast to gay men, lesbians have consistently failed to claim commercial public space in enduring ways, my work on the Sapphic Cabaret shows this to be untrue. And the stakes of these claims are very high, since if they're shown to be accurate, they actually require us to rewrite queer history, urban history, and the scholarship on social geography, while revealing that none of these domains are as androcentric or as heteronormative as previously presumed. 
Now, most of the scholarship on French lesbianism in the modern period focuses on Paris Lesbos in the early years of the 20th century and describes the elite literary world of women like Natalie Barney, Renée Vivienne, Gertrude Stein, and Colette. My work focuses instead on a world of public spaces, cabarets, bars, dance halls, and public figures, singers, club managers, celebrities, that I claim had an equal, if not more important, purchase on the French public sphere. For the time that remains to me, then, I'm going to argue this perspective by describing the history of the sapphic cabaret. During the 1930s, at least 20 cabarets run by and welcoming women who are attracted to women, most of which have never before been identified or analyzed in the scholarship, open throughout the city of Paris. The opening of these sapphic cabarets made possible the development of an increasingly visible female queer community in the French capital. Most of these cabarets outlasted the war, operating into the 1960s and after. These spaces were microcosms where women who loved women were able to push the boundaries of normative sexual and gender expression. Importantly, thanks to the coverage that sapphic cabarets and the women associated with them received in the media, the press, but also in the cinema, on radio, on records, and eventually on television, and I have a whole chapter on sapphic cabarets on TV in my book. Their influence was far more pervasive than one might expect. Their existence troubles assertions like Michael's that, quote, efforts to appropriate urban space for sexual activity have been the work of gay men in particular, whereas lesbians have tended to be more discreet and more private in the conduct of their sexual lives, unquote. Sapphic cabarets were a subset of the cabarets that have prol proliferated across Paris in the years between 1900 and 1939. And they can be divided into two main categories, cabaret féminin and cabaret artistique. The cabaret féminin function mainly as nightclubs where women can dance together. These venues were publicly identified as sapphic spaces and regularly advertised as such in the local press. Among the most famous were Le Monocle in Montparnasse and Le Fetiche in Pigalle, which was likely the model for Colette's uh, lesbian bar in her 1931 novella, The Pure and the Impure. Cabaret Féminin frequently employed cross-dressed serving girls known as entraîneuses, and we can see images of those in the photos by Brassai, which some of you might be familiar with. Women whose goals were to increase alcohol sales and, quote, heat up the cabaret ambiance, tasks they undertook by chatting up dancing, and sometimes sleeping with the customers. Although Cabaret Féminin attracted women of all social classes, because they were patronized not only by women seeking others of the same sex, but also by female sex workers, and sometimes by heterosexual voyeurs, they were often seen as dens of iniquity, a reputation that kept some women interested in other women away. The second category of sapphic cabaret was the Cabaret Artistique, these consisted of bourgeois venues, uh, most famously Suzy Solidor's La Vie Parisienne, owned and run by women with a known penchant for those of their own sex. These spaces align with our traditional concept of the cabaret. It was the performers, not the audience, who were the main attraction. Sapphic cabaret artistique were more upscale. Their clientele were mainly in the know about the special morals of many of the women who congregated there. Solidor's sapphic liaisons were a hot topic in the press. But unlike the Cabaret Féminin, these venues were not explicitly advertised as sapphic spaces. Their ambiguous status made them safer than Cabaret Féminin, where the potential for police harassment, even though female homosexuality was not uh, illegal at the time, um, kept many bourgeois women away. Cabaret Artistique attracted affluent, mixed gender audiences a self-selecting crowd whose views were generally more indulgent toward conduct outside the heterosexual norm. And not all of those present at the Sapphic Cabaret, um, whether female or not, were white. And I can talk about that in the Q&A of A, in the Q &A if anybody's interested. In order to explain the historical importance of the Sapphic Cabaret to both queer and urban histories, I've coined a term that I call Sapphic Genealogical Geographies. I use the term to indicate two things. First, to show that the commercial spaces of female homosexual sociability that aggregated in particular sections of the city 
did so not merely for pragmatic reasons, but also because of the close social and emotional ties between the women who ran them, and second, to demonstrate that these ties stabilized a sapphic geography genealogically across generations. From the 1930s through the 1960s, Parisian sapphic cabarets clustered tightly in four locations, three on the right bank and one on the left. The bourgeois cabaret artistique were all on the right bank, either near the Rue Sainte Anne, close to the Opéra, or farther west in the chic district around the Champs Elysees. In contrast, most cabarets féminins were either farther north, on the right bank, in the working class stomping grounds in Montmartre and Pigalle, or farther south, on the left bank in Montparnasse. Each of these areas became what we might call sapphic micro-territories, in which women could traverse from one sapphic venue to another with ease. Sapphic micro-territories have emotional, commercial, and symbolic effects. They provide women with a sense of security in numbers, create economies of agglomeration, in which like enterprises profit from grouping together, and finally, they challenge the illusion that public space is naturally heterosocial and androcentric, rather than the result of unequal hierarchical relations of power and sexual privilege. Such spaces where one can meet others like oneself and, quote, experience fully one's sexual identity are also a condition of subjective visibility and therefore of symbolic social existence. They express, in Henri Lefebvre's words, one's droit à la ville, right to the city. Sapphic cabarets in the French capital were governed by geographic proximity and genealogical affiliation. Thus, once one Sapphic cabaret opened, other women regularly opened their own cabarets nearby. If a Sapphic cabaret closed, its manager frequently attempted to reopen a new business in the vicinity of the original locale. Businesses were also transferred from one woman to the next across generations, a fact that established both geographic and affective genealogical continuity within the Sapphic community, while ensuring the maintenance of Sapphic control over parts of the urban map. And if I had more time, I could discuss numerous examples of affiliation and proximity. But today, I'm just going to offer one neighborhood, the Opéra, one street, the Rue Sainte Anne, and one cabaret, La Vie Parisienne, which was first opened in 1933 by Susie Solidor as an example of this. La Vie Parisienne provides a salient example of sapphic proliferation and transfer since it both attracted other sapphic venues to the vicinity, including multiple cabarets run by Agnès Capri and Sidonie Baba, and it was itself owned successively by Susie Solidor from 1933 to 1946, by the singer and actress Colette Mars from 1946 to 1959, and by the nightclub manager Fred from 1959 to 1970, who renamed the cabaret Fred's Le Carrel's Club after she took over the premises in 1959. So after almost four decades of sapphic domination, the Rue Sainte Anne was appropriated by a growing gay male scene. In the 1970s, it became the site of Le Palace and Le Set, both of them are discos, the Palace was modeled on Studio 54 in New York, and Le Bronx, Paris's first backroom bar. In response to these developments, Michael once argued, and I quote, the homosexual heyday of the Rue Saint Anne <coughs> coincided with the era of sexual liberation that began in France in May 1968. Unquote. The erasure of the sapphic history on the Rue Saint Anne, seen here, represents a larger historical erasure of queer female geographies in France <coughs> that bears emphasizing. The thriving history of venues like La Vie Parisienne, with its transfer from one woman to the next multiple times over the course of 40 years, as well as the plethora of sapphic cabarets established around it, disproves such claims, while flipping more general conclusions about the causal relationship between male and female queer urban spaces on their head. It's usually said that you know, gay male spaces come first, and female spaces, a few of them, come after. So in conclusion, because of the ways in which heterosexism androcentrism and patriarchy shape our understanding of the public sphere. To write about the emergence of sapphic space in the modern city is not merely a historical enterprise. It can also serve as an exercise in restorative social justice. In France, 
this type of work, which is premised on the belief that groups should be able to have rights to public space as groups, is particularly fraught because of the difficulty of, quote, adopting a strategy based on a notion of collective identity in a nation where collective rights are disavowed. The history of the Sapphic Cabaret in France is thus imbricated in Lefebvre's notion of le droit à la ville, the right to the city. By extension, this history is inseparable from the political, social, economic, cultural, and moral ideologies that shape how that city and the nation it resides in are conceptualized, experienced, conferred, or denied. And to that end, it's important to remember that in order for private actions to count in a public way, they require what Michael Warner calls a context of publicness. And between the 1930s and the 1960s, sapphic cabarets in France provided this context. And I think Michael's work, Public uh, City, Public Sex, talks a lot about this, and it's a great book, so you should all read it. Um, indeed, the sapphic cabarets made possible the proto-development of a queer female counterpublic, understood as a public that is a relation among strangers, that is aware of its subordinate status, that is in tension with a larger public, and that makes possible new forms of gendered and sexual citizenship. The historical impact of these venues was further enhanced in the 1950s and 60s when French TV carried images of the women who owned and worked in them into living rooms across the nation, providing alternative models of female subjects, sexual subjectivity long before the emergence of movements for lesbian and gay rights in the 1970s and 80s. But that is a story for another day. Thank you very much.